Okay, um, so hello everybody and welcome to the Golden Eye side event. Uh, my name is Marco Paavola and I'm from the Technical Research Center of Finland and I'm the coordinator control of uh, contact of this project. And uh, Golden Eye is an Earth observation and data fusion platform. Uh, for certain applications in the mining industry and I will first give a quick overview of the project and let then our expert uh, panelist to start speaking. Um, okay, so we did the coordinates this as I told you earlier and uh, it's a quite big project. Uh, the total budget is 10.7 million euros and it's an innovation action project in Horizon 2020. Uh, project duration is 3.5 years, so we have a half a year extension because of the COVID. And I must say that despite of the COVID, we have progressed quite well in, in our project, so everything is going quite smoothly forward. Um, the consortium also is quite large, so we have 16 partners and those include uh, mining solution providers from various disciplines, technology companies, so we have sensor and drones and AI companies, we have mining sites, um, five of those, so what the things we developed, develop will be tested also in the field, so in Romania, Bulgaria, Finland, Germany and Kosovo. We have universities included, so we have University of Oulu from Finland, it's near to the place where I live, University of, uh, Universita Technica Klutsnapoka from Romania, and then Sofia University from Bulgaria. And of course we have the Research Institute, which means VTT. And here is the overview picture about the project. So. Um, uh, as you can see, we have several data sources on the left hand side, so we do some uh, development of new measurement technologies, for example, VTT develops the proximal sensors, um, but the main role here is the platform, satellite and drone data. So we combine the data from these sources, we have the data acquisition systems, data processing system, and especially data pre-processing is very important. And we have the data fusion in the platform side. So from these three sources, the data is combined and then we build applications based on the data. And Taras will tell more about this, so I will be very brief, but the applications will be worker safety related, operational efficiency related, and environmental monitoring related applications. So Taras will talk about the platform and data acquisition processing and visualization, and then there will be more about the applications in the field trials presented by Kamen and Andreas. And indeed, the applications are intended to provide actionable insights based on the data. And the speakers today, so I am Marco, as I told you, then we have Taras Matselyk next, who is the Chief uh, Executive Officer and Chief Technical Officer at OpNet. Welcome Taras. And our scientific, uh, so Taras is also the technical manager of the project. Our scientific manager is Professor Kamen Bogdanov from Sofia University and he will be sharing the session with Andreas, who is the head of competence team, uh, geology and raw materials from PEAK. And finally, we have the networking session in the end, uh, which is hosted by Seva, who is business development director from OpNet. So welcome all the speakers. And quick look to the schedule, so the introduction is soon ending and then we will start with the Earth observations with satellite platforms presented by Taras. We will have a small break, uh, five minutes only, so be quick at 9.55 and then there will be a session about field trials uh, led by Kamen and Andreas and then the workshop and networking event which is hosted by Seva. 
And then there's a note from the organizers of the event. Please make or present your questions uh, via chat panel, please. Sorry, it should say present questions via chat panel. So we will, of course, answer answer speaking to those. Okay, so this was my part. And I think I remained in five minutes or so. And I will stop now sharing and Taras, it's your turn. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, it is a thank you very much for being with us so early and for following uh, this uh, side event. Uh, as uh, I'm very happy to be here and to present to you about uh, the uh, progress that we have achieved uh, on the GoldenEye uh, project. Uh, today, as agenda uh, will be uh, of this section, it will be focused on the platform capabilities uh, that we have developed, um, and uh, it will include the following parts. So first, we will give you the overview of the processing capabilities and automation capabilities uh, of the GoldenEye platform. Then, based on the GoldenEye field trials, uh, we will uh, demonstrate the structure and components of the backend uh, based on virtual demo. So the format of the session was originally planned as a, a real or uh, in-person workshop where we would be even able to give um, some hands-on sessions, <clears throat> but in order to conduct this particular uh, virtual uh, session, uh, we had chosen for the virtual demo where uh, the real commands and uh, real uh, screenshots uh, of uh, the uh, backend applications and uh, will be presented as a set of slides. So the, the whole presentation consists of uh, almost 90 slides but uh, we will uh, walk through them in a kind of like a multi multiplication kind of mode so we will be switching the slides quickly uh, as if we were performing these commands and this this set of slides is intended to be used <clears throat> as a tutorial after the completion of uh, this presentation um, especially when you are using uh, the uh, the platform in uh, in the future, uh, as if there are any users among you uh, who will be uh, taking benefits, and then we will end up with a Q and A session. Uh, also, there is a uh, there is a planned live demonstration of the graphical user interface, which will take place uh, at the end of uh, the side event uh, at the last half an hour. So we are hoping that everybody will stay with us till then. Uh, so that we could show you more about the uh, about the visualization and uh, interaction capabilities of the platform. Um, the overview of the engine um, could be described that um, it's based on a number of predecessor products that have existed from different partners of the consortium, which are all uh, assembled together in one uh, GoldenEye platform. So GoldenEye platform will have a graphical user interface uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the backend, powerful backend, which uh, we called uh, Oakley, and uh, some of the commands will be presented to you. The main purpose of uh, the GoldenEye platform is to make uh, the remote uh, sensing data processing easy and affordable. And um, to do this, Golden AI platform integrates uh, so-called artificial intelligence knowledge packs, uh, which are basically like cookbooks for uh, AI and uh, for the backend processing engine um, to enable execution of specific use cases, such as mineral detection, time series processing um, or for the vegetation purposes, uh, for vegetation dynamics analysis, yeah, for exploration and ecological monitoring of the mining sites in different uh, cycles of the mining activities. Uh, there will be a dedicated AI knowledge packs uh, um, developed for, for each um, and every uh, use case, uh, which will be described uh, later in, the, in this presentation. And dedicated AI uh, uh, knowledge packs integrate analysis-ready data. So, um, so there are some some AI knowledge packs which involve less of AI, more linear processing, 
um, saying this, uh, uh, then nevertheless, it makes them still very powerful because uh, traditional analysis ready data preparation uh, activities could be also executed with this approach, uh, such as generation of multi temporal uh, uh, data sets, which are suitable um, for, for further analysis. Sometimes even fusing um, the very diverse data sets together so that more complex uh, calculations could be performed on them. So first, uh, before we dive into the details, I would like to describe to you about who or, and uh, which partners or which actors uh, will be using um, the platform. So first of all, there are on-platform uh, actors uh, which are participating in the Golden Eye. Um, not, not necessarily consortium. Uh, of course, uh, all consortium partners are um, uh, presented uh, here, are listed here. But uh, there is also possibility to uh, perform off-platform data uh, delivery, processing, and publishing. And Golden AI platform would allow these uh, actors to act together um, <clears throat> through the set of APIs and secure access procedures. <clears throat> So there are three main roles uh, for the actors. The first one is a data provider. So data provider role is uh, to, as the name implies, to provide uh, various uh, earth observation data, remote sensing data, in situ measurement, uh, among uh, many other that are possible to generate. Um, the data that has been collected at this stage could be either processed on the platform with the platform capabilities uh, or off the platform. And this role is uh, dedicated to the data processor actor. And finally, when the data is analyzed and analysis is generated, um, uh, it could be published for the visualization. Again, uh, the, uh, this role is called data publisher. And um, again, this could be on the platform and off uh, platform. Uh, I will explain uh, how these different actors interact together in the next slide on the high level architecture. So this is, uh, as promised, uh, this is a high level of architecture of the product, which is uh, arranged, uh, uh, it's a complex structure, which was already developed and it is running. Um, uh, in the prototype phase, uh, we are testing the scalability and performance, and already the first users are using it. Uh, these, uh, these are today uh, the one of the partners of, um, of uh, GoldenEye Consortium, uh, and uh, they uh, work on uh, the long time series processing for surface displacement analysis with the interferometric SAR data provided through the platform and um, consumed, processed, and uh, delivered uh, to the visualization. So the main components um, of the platforms are the data inputs. So this is uh, where the data uh, providers come in. Uh, then through the set of architectural um, implementations which assure the access control and security monitoring and performance of the platform. These are technical pillars which are protecting like uh, modes, uh, the uh, entry into the platform. Then there are, everything is based on the compute jobs which are executed through the uh, command line interface uh, language on the Oakley platform, um, which could then be executed as uh, just processes um, in the virtual machines or as Docker containers uh, on the larger distributed architectures. Uh, again, this could be done uh, through this uh, Oakley platform, uh, which uh, resembles uh, to a certain degree a popular orchestration, uh, IT orchestration platforms you know, like Kubernetes, uh, like uh, Ansible and uh, others uh, with whom some of you might have, uh, have experience with. Uh, the data which is being generated by the compute jobs uh, is migrating through several sets of uh, storage buckets. Uh, we call them buckets for the reason, uh, because uh, they could be um, deployed in different uh, hardware uh, architectures. So, for example, the EO data buckets, which are uh, mimicking the way how um, Copernicus Diaz platforms uh, offer the data. 
provides us uh, with uh, the source data. Uh, the commercial or other party data could also be integrated in this storage, and this storage is typically large, uh, could uh, spawn petabytes of st storage, and uh, fairly cheap and uh, relatively slow, because uh, the processing is not intended to be performed on this data. We only need fast read and uh, fast transfer operations from this storage into the compute environment. The compute environment that I already mentioned could be on virtual machines and dockers, and, um, and the main requirement here is fast processing, a lot of RAM, and uh, necessary resources, necessary computing resources, which could include GPUs as well, for example, for some AI analysis. When the data is being prepared and analyzed, uh, we are working with the in bucket, which includes data stacks. So data stacks is the first iteration of analysis-ready data, it's homogeneous, uh, sometimes uh, uh, products or homogeneous or homogenized time series of products, uh, which are, have been calibrated, uh, geometrically corrected, uh, if necessary, or to rectify uh, the processing, uh, like atmospheric corrections could be done, uh, radiometric uh, calibration could be performed, uh, terrain corrections, and most important, the um, the co-registration of the images. So this is a very important part because co-registration, but at the, same, at the stage of the stacks, the data is still not, um, is still um, homogeneous, but uh, in different products. So for example, Sentinel-1 products will, will be in one stack, Sentinel-2 products will be in other stacks, et cetera. Um, the real the, the in storage typically is based on uh, fast uh, storage devices such as NVMe hard drives or fast uh, SSD drives uh, because we need the ultimate performance here so that uh, these stacks could be created quickly from the raw source data. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the first stage of analysis ready data preparation because before any complex activities could be performed, uh, we need to produce uh, so-called uh, heterogeneous analysis ready, analysis ready data. This is where uh, the diverse data stacks uh, will be assembled into precisely co-registered uh, data cubes. Uh, we like to call them hypercubes because uh, we could easily mix uh, the data from Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 uh, Terrasar uh, and uh, even drones, uh, uh, remote sensor data into these uh, tensors. So again, the out uh, storage is also based on SSD or NVMe uh, devices, typically separate hardware so that the in write and read operations could be performed uh, in parallel uh, without affecting the system bus performance. Sometimes they could be even located on different uh, VMs uh, or in the different Docker containers and in different compute jobs. And this is in this storage, we also store the out data, uh, which uh, resides as a set of uh, tensors and uh, could also be converted into the NV format uh, or cloud optimized uh, GeoTIFFs. So what happens later is the, this analyzed data needs to be visualized. And this is where the publishing process is working. Because so far, this process that I describe in this section is performed by the data, um, uh, data processors. So uh, the final step is the data publishers is uh, when uh, the cloud optimized GeoTIFFs are being published into the S3 uh, cloud optimized storage. So it's a COS um, uh, devices. Uh, and they could be distributed uh, through the cloud, sometimes spawning multiple providers. And this is where this data is being served through the uh, GUI interface. So this is part of this, uh, that which is highlighted here, for different uh, types of uh, outputs. And uh, this uh, process is guided with the artificial intelligence assistant, which helps the users of the platform to interact with the platform in natural human language. Uh, this way, this way, minimizing the need for training and the, the need for um, actually, it's even time because it's much easier to work with the platform in natural uh, com common language, uh, common language as well, so that uh, you don't have to know all the buttons, uh, all the settings, all the clicks that you need to to perform in order to get to the necessary results. 
Uh, last but not least, the system was designed to be interoperable with the Euro data cubes. And today we already integrated the ingest of the raw data uh, through the Euro data cube facility presented through the Sentinel hub API. So now a quick move into the data flow diagrams uh, where we explain how the data is moving. So from uh, the data sources on the left of this picture, the data is being uh, acquired and stored in uh, the EO data bucket. Uh, this is a long-term storage, so and this is where the raw data resides. When uh, the partner-specific applications um, or proprietary code or any user application which needs to create results or generate results in the platform, uh, the uh, this 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 uh, recycling of the data is implemented through. Uh, the uh, processing from Earth observation data stacks into Earth observation data data cubes, and uh, eventually into uh, process data, which uh, presents uh, Earth observation data insights, which are then published through the artificial intelligence platform delivery interfaces, and then presented to the Golden application and service providers through the set of platform interfaces. The users of the platform through the web request and response interface could interact with the data as well as uh, GoldenEye and non-GoldenEye end users could access the platform through the sets of APIs and system interfaces, kind of like machine-to-machine -machine interfaces. The Eurodata Cube facility also is integrated through uh, the uh, set of uh, data cube, uh, so through the set of APIs, which are supporting uh, standard interfaces. A uh, few, um, so before, uh, let, now let's move into the actual uh, virtual demonstration, um, which will be shown on the, on the set of uh, the field trial use cases. Um, for, before we start, for each field trial, we need to load the, um, uh, the area of interest or the region of interest. Um, these uh, two terms different, uh, are different from each other. The area of interest, uh, you could see them, uh, these are small, uh, relatively small uh, patches of earth uh, surface representing a particular site. So this could be a mine, this could be a factory, this could be a particular exploration region, uh, which are then united in a larger region of interest. Uh, this is done um, uh, uh, for the purpose. Uh, and these are terms inside of the platform uh, because the region of interest is uh, used for search of the Earth observation data that covers this particular region. And uh, the areas of interest are used for performance of a certain analysis. So, for example, if we need to calculate a certain indexes, if we need to perform uh, a specific uh, tasks and, and actions on the site, this is uh, what areas of interest are uh, created for. And they greatly simplify and accelerate the processing capabilities. So here you can see the field trial, the depiction of the field trial uh, in uh, the platform GUI for uh, the Germany, the Erzgebirge site. Um, below, uh, there is a representation of the exploration site in Bulgaria. On the next slide, um, uh, you can see the open pit extraction uh, site in Romania. Um, and um, um, and uh, finally, um, there, there, there's a site in, so actually not finally, but uh, there, another field ride, the fourth field ride is uh, in Pihasalmi mine in Finland, which consists of uh, three areas of interest, which depict the tailing ponds, uh, the, uh, the extraction pit, uh, the, uh, uh, the, and, and, and the factory and, and the processing areas of the mine. Uh, and uh, the last uh, are several tailing ponds uh, uh, in uh, Kosovo, which uh, will be monitored for uh, ecological uh, and, um, and uh, f f geological stability. Uh, the areas of interest and, um, and uh, regions of interest could be created in the platform GUI by simply drawing them and saving them as GeoJSON files or exported and imported as KML files. So the goal of the project is to follow the OGC standards as far as much as possible. And this is why these standards were chosen because they are OGC compliant standards and they simplify exchange 
of the data between uh, the GoldenEye platform and other sources. Um, the, here's the structure uh, of uh, the data processing in the backend of the platform. Uh, which is logically organized uh, to uh, basically enable any processing activities um, in, uh, a, a, in an easy and structured way. So uh, the work uh, on the tasks uh, in uh, the GoldenEye platform backend uh, is defined uh, and starts with creation of the project where the general parameters are set and uh, where uh, your regions of interest and areas of interest are associated with the project. Uh, regions of interest and areas of interest are specific to each project. So if you need to work on a different region of interest or uh, need to have a different set of AOIs, uh, which completely in a different location, uh, it is recommended to logically structure your work in different projects. It is possible to have many regions of interest and many areas of interest uh, associated in the project, so you could switch be between them in, in each tasks individually. The tasks are created in the project and they are based on specific templates uh, which are designed to do a particular work, uh, designed to, pre to perform a particular analysis. Um, Tasks are usually associated and more narrow, uh, actually they should be as narrow as possible, to uh, the goal that you are trying to achieve with the task, with the objectives. So if you have, for example, the analysis which requires Sentinel-1 data for surface displacement, uh, it should not be done in the same task as NDVI index calculation, uh, because uh, simply uh, it is impossible uh, because it, they, they require different uh, AI knowledge packs, as we call them, a different template. So uh, when you create a task, uh, at this moment, uh, the template for, uh, the, uh, for the objective of the, of the task is selected and hard associated with the task. So if you cannot change uh, the purpose of the task after its creation. So if you need to have another task, you need to create a new task with, with another purpose. So this is important to remember. The tasks could be switched uh, within the project uh, through the activation, uh, or uh, the system will pick up the default task, uh, which is the last task that was uh, uh, created, unless uh, it was overridden with uh, the explicit task activation. So uh, there are some examples uh, of the uh, user interface um, of the Oakley and uh, with uh, the some metadata. So, uh, in this particular case, we you see our uh, uh, our project uh, server uh, located in Creo Diaz. Uh, you can even see its IP address. Uh, uh, it is uh, re access to the platform requires uh, the, uh, uh, the the user account. So, you have to have uh, the user account, which could be obtained from uh, the GoldenEye Consortium, um, and. Um, uh, and this is where the platform could be accessed. So you can access the platform from any uh, operating system, um, Windows, uh, Mac, uh, Linux, uh, any, anything you prefer, anything you can even probably access the system from your iPad if you have remote shell installed on it. And um, interaction with the GoldenEye backend is performed through the command line. It's an intelligent command line interface, which allows the user to ask for help uh, to perform autocomplete operations and uh, also a set of service functions. So this is a powerful backend interface, which was designed to do very complex and massive tasks quickly. So this is an interface not for the amateurs, but for the professionals, and it requires training. But as I mentioned, uh, this uh, interface is very similar to the very popular uh, platforms on the, bar on the market, which are designed for complex IT platform orchestration. It is uh, even based along the same principles. For example, the platform is integratable with Kubernetes K8S uh, orchestration engine, so that multiple compute jobs could be, if necessary, uh, performed and run at the same time on the massive computing infrastructures. So next um, uh, part of uh, the 
this presentation, I would like to uh, highlight some of the main components that you uh, as a user will be working in the tasks. So each task must have a region of interest. And the region of interest may have various areas of interest as I, as I did. If you need to perform complex time series analysis, the inclusion of areas of interest is mandatory. Uh, um, and um, uh, the, uh, the, there is a necessity to assign the areas of interest which will be processed in a sequence uh, to a certain pipelines. Uh, so pipeline uh, is just a chosen uh, tag. Uh, it's just a word you, you could use any unique uh, name here, which makes sense to you. Uh, but the whole idea is that if you want uh, the pipeline processing to be performed as a sequence uh, for the same task, your pipeline should be the same for all components of the task. Uh, so it should have the same name, like either pipeline or uh, you know, call it uh, script one, script two, whatever makes sense. Uh, there are concept of buckets. Uh, so buckets are uh, dynamically calculated uh, sets of products uh, which are inherently uh, dictated by uh, the specifics of the task that you're trying to perform. And for example, if you're planning to perform interferometric analysis for the surface displacement with Sentinel-1 um, data, the buckets will uh, contain uh, the sets of uh, imagery uh, like typically it's a level one SLC product for, uh, for example, interferometric analysis, which are suitable for the analysis and performance of a particular task. So in the case of synthetic antenna aperturator interferometric analysis, the bucket will contain uh, images uh, which are covering the areas or regions of interest to a certain degree and are suitable for interferometric analysis. They are interferometrically compatible pairs or sequences. The same thing goes for any other data. So you could create buckets for Sentinel-2 data and uh, other, uh, although in Sentinel-2 data, the, the concept of bucket just covers the same footprint. Uh, so essentially the images which are aligned uh, on the orbital path um, and cover the, the same uh, geometric, ge geographic area. For the change detection and some of the calculation methods, it's also necessary to create the master and the slave, um, or not create, but define the master and slave images. Uh, the terminology comes from interferometric and uh, SAR analysis, but the idea is uh, basically that uh, the master is the most recent image and the slave is the older or oldest image uh, in, in the series. So it enables change detection as well as uh, as uh, some uh, so, so some change uh, calculation um, and some change metric calculation. So next uh, slide is uh, also showing some more of the backend structures and components. And um, uh, this one, uh, this image, this screenshot shows the tasks that have been created. Uh, in the project, which we called Golden Eye. So you could see uh, here uh, with the gray uh, color, it was the commanded operator issue. Uh, the uh, task list um, for the project, so second yellow line is information line. So we say uh, we have a project Golden Eye. And the active task is Golden Eye field trial Finland data samples, for example. Um, Here, you could also list all the regions of interest and areas of interest that have been defined. So in this particular project, uh, GoldenEye, we have uh, many uh, areas of interest and many regions of interest, uh, which are uh, aligned and uh, organized in a set of processing pipelines, which allow us to perform different uh, activities. Also, you see the statistics uh, measured in uh, area uh, of uh, the uh, of the target uh, uh, target uh, region or area of interest measured in square kilometers, as well as uh, position um, of the area measured in uh, the uh, in the radians. Um, 
in geographic latitude and longitude. Here's another example where you could see the list of regions of interest, uh, which also displays uh, the similar statistics as well as assignment to the pipeline. So uh, here you can also organize the regions of interest in different pipelines. And uh, in this way, you can align and tell the, the platform uh, that uh, one area of interest is part of uh, the pipeline uh, covering the entire regional interest. It is logical that the pipelines for the regions should be different. Otherwise, you will be mixing the incompatible areas and the system will generate the errors because your areas of interest would be outside of your region of interest and uh, that will cause an error. Uh, please uh, keep in mind that the bounding boxes uh, here listed here with minimum latitude and maximum latitude uh, will enable us to check if the pipeline is correct and if uh, it's not matching, uh, the, there will be a problem generated. You can also preview uh, your, um, your uh, the, the material that you collected for your tasks before assigning it to your task. So, for example, in this case, uh, we are previewing the configured task uh, with master and slave uh, images selected. And we visualize it against uh, the map of the region and the silhouette of our region of interest. So in this particular case, uh, on the right, you see that the region of interest is the gray area defined. The bounding box of this area is the dotted red line. And these three colored stripes, uh, which are, uh, well, uh, consist of a lot of horizontal stripes, this is a visualization of Sentinel-1 SLC product, which consists of three interferometric swaths. Each swath has its own color. So, for example, uh, the slave image, uh, interferometric Y3, which you can probably see on the slide here, is depicted with a yellow color. And because uh, the images sort of overlap with each other, then uh, ideally, you should see the picture like this. In some cases, you could have two products which have misalignment of the bursts, or, uh, which is a common uh, occurrence with Sentinel-1, um, which is happening due to the scheduling and the specific of uh, the top separation of the SAR instrument on Sentinel-1. Actually, in this uh, diagram, you could see this specific. Uh, the uh, TOPS mode in uh, Sentinel-1 works by periodic scanning, uh, basically making a snapshot of a single burst along the track of the satellite, uh, which periodically switches between first, second, and third swath. Uh, this is why you see this uh, displacement along the satellite motion track between three swath, and uh, where each subsequent burst is shifted a little bit. The time of requisition of each burst is around two and a half seconds. So by the time that this bird acquisition is completed, the satellite moved uh, down the track and it moved down the track uh, for, the, for, the, for the third image. So this is, this is a very good visualization, which is um, not present in other tools. So for example, if you would like to understand the Sentinel-1 uh, acquisition geometry based on uh, ESA SNAP tool, uh, this visualization is much more simplified. The burst are aligned and the, um, and, and the swaths are aligned and, uh, and uh, much more difficult to understand. But here it's uh, very uh, easy to understand how the overlap between the bursts and swath is occurring as well. So in some cases, you could uh, derive additional analysis if your area of interest is tiny and fits in one burst and between the overlapping area. So you have actually uh, an increased number of imagery to work with and it's easy to understand. There are also some statistics displayed here about uh, the area overlap of uh, our target area. So in these cases the area overlap is measured in fraction and the highest area overlap is uh, close to 19 percent uh, that we have here. It's because uh, the area is quite large and uh, it needs to be covered by two swaths. Let's move on. Uh, so uh, in this uh, slide, we will uh, describe uh, to you uh, how um, uh, Oakley structure and components uh, of the task are integrating together. So each task has a recipe file. 
So a recipe file is basically like a cookbook for AI. It, it tells AI and uh, the processing engine everything it needs to know to prepare and uh, generate this uh, this uh, this uh, the analysis on the particular on this uh, on this uh, project. Um, when we create a task, task is based on AI um, uh, knowledge pack template. It is selected only once during the creation of the task and it can be parameterized by the user. So these parameters for, for example, uh, for Gaussian mixtures, if you are using uh, Gaussian mixture AI predictors or uh, specifying which denoising filters you want to, uh, to engage. How many clusters do you want to generate in case of AI? So this is just an example how different parameters of the AI knowledge packs could be changed by the user when they run the analysis in the GoldenEye platform. On this slide, um, we show further how the image components are used and uh, arranged and processed uh, in uh, the uh, backend and uh, how we create the stacks and analysis ready data tensors um, in the scope. So again, um, we take the set of uh, the, the tasks, which are specified with the master and slave images with the number of the source swath and births in case of Sentinel-1, uh, for example. Then uh, we generate the stack, which is the first stage of analysis ready data. Then it is uh, converted in the tensor, which is enriched with additional data that uh, is uh, often uh, could, could, could add additional data sets, channels to, to the data set, and it's all governed with the recipe file. Here's the complete um, description of the steps, uh, 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 how various products could be created in uh, the GoldenEye uh, backend platform. Um, usually, if uh, you have to perform these steps anyway, if you use any kind of geospatial analytics tool, uh, I remember the time when I was using uh, ESA Snap2, which is a very great platform, but it requires a lot of skill sets. And I had uh, these uh, papers uh, with uh, the similar uh, checklists <laughs> written in front of me, uh, often on a yellow sticker next to monitor, where, which were reminding me which step I need to do when and how. In Oakley platform, this procedure is uh, greatly automated and uh, it is more streamlined. So after creating your analytical task once, you could even create a script uh, either in Python or in simple as a simple set of bash commands, uh, which are running uh, in the Linux shell. And uh, the very complex steps, which were taking to me personally hours uh, of work uh, with the Sentinel, uh, with, uh, with the ESA snap tool, now could be performed in 15 minutes to, uh, to half an hour, depending on how much analytical uh, data you want to process. And uh, just to give you uh, an idea, the uh, one uh, uh, product, of Sentinel-1 data, which includes three swath, could be processed and analyzed uh, in uh, the Oakley platforms in roughly about half an hour. So this is how from the beginning and to the end and uh, on the highly performance system, it could be probably even performed even faster because this duration is, uh, is not requiring human intervention anymore once it's uh, implemented and, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and executed. Here we are going to go into this virtual demonstration, which was supposed to be live. And um, I will show you how to create the project in the tool, how to publish, how to create the, and analyze the data, and uh, how to find the data, how to select the data, how to create the uh, products, and how to publish them. So the first step is to create the product. The tool uh, is, uh, so th this uh, sessions and these screenshots were uh, collected and recorded for the purpose of this uh, presentation by Francisco Gutierrez, to whom I'm giving kudos <laughs> for this tireless work. He is our geospatial uh, data analyst. And if you're involved in the project, uh, you will uh, already know him. And if you're not yet, so you will become um, uh, familiar with him. 
So first we create a new project and uh, there is a possibility to use help um, or with the platform which would guide you through the creation of different tasks. In this case, we created the project, a golden eye, and we activated the project um, so that it becomes our active project for default operations in case if we uh, forget where we are. Second step, we create a new task. In this task, uh, we are using uh, the knowledge uh, pack, uh, which was specifically created for Sentinel-2 uh, data processing. Uh, you can see it here. We specify it during the creation of the task with the minus T option. There are different knowledge packs uh, present in the system. Uh, and for different tasks, you need to select it. Remember that this selection must be done only once in the uh, during the creation of the task. One, so you have created the task, changing the template uh, is impossible uh, because it's too complex. So it's easier and the, the, the standard rule is that you just create a new task for the different templates. Here you could verify all the tasks that you have already created in the system. There are plenty, as you can see. Each and any of these tasks could be uh, selected and executed uh, at the operator desire. So in this particular case, uh, the number task number 10 here, uh, the field trial Germany Sentinel-1 AI pack has been activated. That means that all the subsequent commands um, which do not specify uh, the task explicitly will uh, be running on the on this task number 10. Next step is to actually populate and define our regions of interest and areas of interest. So in this case, uh, we are adding a new type uh, of uh, type field. So this is just a type of uh, image uh, of uh, the area uh, which we add. Uh, and a particular goal is to perform soil moisture mapping uh, for a specific site in uh, Ashgeberg uh, trial site. One more time, good to verify. We can always verify the created areas of interest and how did we map them. So what type they are, which uh, pipelines they belong to, and what are the geometries? So always good to check and double check your work through the verification steps. Next. Five yes. minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you for reminding, uh, Marco. Then I will probably only go through one use case here. And there are other use cases you could use um, in the recording of this session and uh, just going through them uh, through this presentation as a tutorial. So uh, we are moving on. So we are creating the region of interest in this task uh, and verifying the region of interest. And this is where we have the ability to assign our areas of interest created earlier to the regions of interest. Final step, uh, we are verifying the product list uh, that we have created and the metadata of the task of our recipe and checking that our configuration is correct. So in this case, we are also have the ability to select the, um, the imagery for analysis from the buckets, which have been already uh, arranged. And uh, here you could uh, see that your attention is being drawn to the area overlap. So you should always look for the area overlap one for this particular bucket. So that means that this bucket is ideal for our use. Here you could see the starting date of the images in the bucket, of the products in the bucket, and the end date. The buckets are uh, calculated uh, completely automatically, and there are 30 images. So our master and slave actually already assigned from this bucket to the project. So you could see this with the indication of M and S here. If we would like to look inside of the bucket, this is uh, where the bucket show command is for. We specify the bucket. The naming um, conventions for the buckets are following the satellite name, the platform, the instrument or the product type, the relative orbit, ascending or descending, and the military grid coordinate, uh, which are mimicking how Sentinel-2 products names are derived. And uh, here we see all the products that have been placed into the bucket. Um, the uh, verification that the same relative orbit has been selected. By the way, you could modify the number of columns and types of columns uh, which are displayed with additional 
command uh, line options here, uh, which you can see through the help. And uh, M and S uh, indicate which current two products have been selected for uh, the task that we will be running. Uh, one more interesting thing, uh, you could probably note the cycle data. So this is uh, an interesting parameter which helps us to understand how the image drift occurs in the Sentinel-1 products. Because with every orbit, uh, the satellite orbit shifts a little bit. And this gives us uh, the relative shift of the acquisition time in seconds from uh, the mean or average uh, acquisition time. Uh, so this product was selected that this is in the middle of uh, the sequence and the other ones are too early or too late. So they are cycling through. That was why uh, that's why a Sentinel one requires reset of acquisition schedules periodically. And you could see that in, uh, if you work with Sentinel one data regularly. So here uh, the selection uh, products have been set and uh, selected. So you could refer to the products by their unique ID, which are four last uh, digits in the product name. So here, this is following the uh, Sentinel one uh, file standard. And uh, this is like a quick shortcut. One more time, we are verifying the visualization, uh, how our region fits into the burst, which uh, also indicates that our region of interest uh, actually needs, doesn't need the whole swath. So we could reduce the number of the burst to speed up the processing. This is some inputs for the configuration. It's the visualization of a second uh, swath and uh, the uh, one more visualization, which shows our area of interest. Uh, for different projects, for different sites. So, for example, in Finland, the area is so tiny and so small that it fits on only one burst. So, the, it could be analyzed uh, faster and um, quicker. So, and now let's move, accelerate a little bit. Um, in this task, number 10, step 10, we are uh, creating uh, the stack. And we created with the uh, internal uh, on the platform uh, SAR processor, which uh, OpNet created specifically for this. It's much faster, it's much more universal, and it produced generally better results than, for example, ESO Snap Tool does. Uh, we create a recipe and refine the recipe. We could also create the bounding box uh, for uh, the zone in case if we don't want to process the whole area. Uh, we can visualize the processed stack by using a simple mentioning of the band. So it creates the RGB, but we could also um, do some band math as well on the fly. So this is an interesting ability of the tool uh, to, um, to zoom. It, here we are showing you how you could zoom in uh, to section of your imagery with uh, the zone as well as use certain visualization technique, uh, which is using RGB a mapping of uh, different uh, components of the generated uh, stack so that you could analyze if the area that you are uh, using uh, is correctly selected. At this stage, uh, area is not geo-corrected. This is just the visualization of the tensor that was created. That's why it's a little bit skewed and uh, it would be uh, geometrically corrected uh, in the later stages. Uh, during the preparation of the visualization of the files in the Kong GeoTiffs. Because we don't need geo correction, all we need is uh, the precise co registration of the pixels of the image uh, at this stage. So, again, a refinement of our recipes, a selection of uh, the certain parameters. Uh, for example, we could influence how the analyzed clusters would be depicted in the GUI here by assigning colors. Uh, by assigning names, specifying how many uh, channels and uh, uh, which particular algorithms that we are using for the AI uh, engine. And uh, now we are assembling the tensor, which is the second step. If you remember, we are first we are now pre pre preparing the stack and then we are creating a tensor. And the tensor can consist many more areas. Again, we could preview and analyze if it fits. Uh, we could also see uh, the bad pixels. Bad pixels are the pixels which have exceeded um, the uh, normal statistical distribution. Uh, also, uh, this could be problems with the acquisition. So sometimes they occur in the raw imagery. So in this case, we have a lot of bad pixels which couldn't be used for analysis. And um, 
uh, we will uh, perform the uh, AI feed and then uh, predict uh, steps, which will generate uh, the set of clusters, uh, which uh, then could be assigned different colors and visualized uh, in the tool. The preview allows you to see the data before you visualize and before you publish it in the GUI. And uh, this is uh, basically it. So we, we are now switching to the next uh, uh, case. Um, so I will skip through this because we are repeating um, the same uh, procedure, but in this case, we are generating the polarimetric SAR image, which uh, you could see here. So it's colorful because we use uh, the uh, the coherence and uh, the slave and master, um, uh, as well as uh, vertical and horizontal polarization for uh, different visualization techniques, which allows us to understand what kind of materials, what kind of surface types we are seeing. Okay, well, I think we are running out of time uh, for uh, the live session, but uh, um, I'm happy for everyone to keep using uh, the products, uh, to learn from it and use these uh, slides for um, as your guidelines, as your tutorial um, during the utilization of uh, the project of the product. Thank you for, for your attention and we are looking forward to work with you in the future. Thank you very much, Taras. So, um, very interesting presentation. I'm afraid we don't have time questions at the moment. So, um, uh, please join to the networking session latest and be also present in the feedbacks. But the questions, I meant to say, the questions will be answered in the networking session latest. So, let's have a two minutes break. So, let's continue. 11.01 or 2 so that Kamen and Andreas will have time to so two minutes break so that the next presenters can prepare for the presentations and then we continue. Thank you. Okay, did you hear me Andreas? Yeah, and we, I see the slides. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. all right. I feel excellent. So we'll start within a few minutes and uh, you'll continue with your, uh, I'll start first, then you'll continue with uh, your trial once. Great. Okay. But yeah, you, you see that uh, Taras didn't have time to present all the things, so we have to be more quick or if we want to present uh, all the slides. Yeah, don't, don't worry, Carmen. Uh, the idea was that I will just... Yes, uh, yes, yes, it was clear for me and uh, for everybody. Uh, if you present one, one example is enough. Uh, better to have more, but it's uh, good enough and it was perfect. Uh, very, very good. Sorry, Taras, I forgot to mention that I will give a note five minutes earlier, so... I hope it didn't disturb you. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Yeah. The interesting thing is see that attendees are only our consortium, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. nothing to do. It's uh, well, it's a good overview for people who are attending. It's good, yeah. good uh, training. For us. <laughs> I think there were was at least one or two outside of the consortium. One or two names I did not recognize, but the, the other ones are from in. Yes, I think so too. Okay, maybe we should start the next presentation and I will note five minutes before the time is up. Okay. So I assume that we can run until 11.33 or so. Maybe 25 minutes is enough for the networking in the end. Okay, let's get started. So come in and Andreas, the stage is yours. Okay. Okay, thank you, Marco. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and to present the highlights from the field trail activities that will demonstrate the power of the GoldenEye platform. Uh, so we have uh, in the platform and in the field trials three types of data. First, we have satellite data. 
different type of satellites that will focus on safety and environmental footprint. Then we have drone supported data that will be used for geophysical analysis, uh, uh, in particular electromagnetic field measurements and multispectral imaging. Uh, this will help for uh, detecting environmental footprints and also for mineral exploration, geophysical data to calibrate satellite based sensors and also drone based sensors. Uh, also, we have proximal sensing that uh, include time gated Raman spectroscopy, active hyperspectral imaging, in uh, precise geolocation based on cellular positioning. This will help uh, to improve safety and also um, will help for mineral exploration to do in situ analysis on mineralogy and uh, exact positioning uh, of the satellite and drone data analysis. Uh, well, for the field trials, we have uh, several field trials to demonstrate solution in exploration in Germany and Bulgaria. Then in open pit uh, mine uh, in Romania. Also, we have to demonstrate uh, underground extraction scenario in Finland and post closure um, case in Kosovo. All these data uh, will be collected for uh, from the field trials and processing uh, to support exploration, extraction and post-closure use cases. Uh, for the first uh, field trail, I will ask uh, my colleague uh, Andreas to present uh, what uh, they are doing and plan to do in Erzgebirge, Germany. Please, Andreas. Yes, uh, thank you, Kamen. Good morning also from, from my side, everyone. Thanks for your time uh, joining. So, uh, first field trial site uh, in Germany, uh, Erzgebirge area. It's a huge area of uh, 5,000 square kilometers already. Um, and it has been famous in the past for silver, uranium, tin, tungsten, lithium mining. Um, and we are especially looking here for stratiform tin mineralizations. And we want to integrate and, and use at different scales, at different levels, uh, remote sensing data, um, drone-based data, and then also near field data for mineral um, knowledge development or mineral predictive mapping. So the next slide. Uh, you can see the area um, on the local level that we are focusing on. This is the area of Pok um, Pokau. Uh, it's 29 uh, square kilometers. And there has been an extensive mining activity there in the 17th and 19th century. And you can see on the right side an example of the mineralization we look for uh, with up to 2% of, of tin in stratiform uh, layers. So on the next slide, uh, we can now see what we actually plan to do in, in Golden AI. We want to develop what Taras mentioned, AI knowledge packs uh, in an external offline platform, which is called Advanced Geo Prediction Software. And it will be done both in 2D and 3D. So we will look on, on a, a rock sample level and do mineral prospectivity in, in, two, in 2D. We also will look at uh, outcrop wall level or scale on site in Poco and do mineral prospectivity mapping in 2D there. And then for the larger area, Poco, the 229 square kilometers, we will look in 3D for mineral prospectivity mapping. On the next slide, you can now see a list of things that are being done already, partly in, in the field or, or planned to be done for the ground proofing and for the creation of the required uh, calibration or training data for the different AI. Uh, knowledge packs and then also uh, algorithms. So we will apply unsupervised and, and mostly supervised classifications uh, in, in AI. So we are taking twin sections and we do uh, portal XF measurements, sphere mapping in the field, also active hyperspectral mapping. And then on drone level, we will do LIDAR and electromagnetics and do a detailed 3D geological modeling. Next slide, please. So here you can see the first results from the mapping on a, a hand specimen scale. So this is on the left side, you can see the first results of the sphere mapping. 
uh, from colleagues from VTT and uh, active hyperspectral mapping is also uh, in process. And on the right side, you can see the reference data using a portable XIF. And these two data sets will now be mapped and then we will do a prospectivity mapping in 2D on, a, on this small scale um, from our hand specimen. On the next slide, you can see the next step. This is already now an outcrop uh, of, of a certain rock or mineralization in, in the field. So it's a larger scale, um, but still a local uh, coordinate system where we will do the same. So we have already created the, the crown proofing data with a portable XF. We have reference data for tin. And now in the next year, it's plans that colleagues from VTT will be there and doing active hyperspectral mapping of, of the whole outcrop wall and also do Raman um, uh, measurements to have additional reference data. Next slide. Uh, in order to create a 3D uh, detailed model of, of the area and in the underground, we are cooperating with uh, Technical University of Freiburg and they applied handheld uh, LIDAR mapping. So we went into the mine already with the LIDAR and also on the surface and it's uh, created uh, huge point clouds for the surface mapping of the area and the underground mapping of the mine. Um, next slide. And this will be then integrated in the 3D um, model of the area. And what is then also PD done in 2022 is then the drone based survey. So on our side, Beak will perform a LIDAR mapping of the area of a smaller part. And the company Radai from Finland is going to do a very unique uh, electromagnetics mapping based on drone uh, drones. You can see some, some pictures from their first test in Finland from the past years. Next slide. So we have already a detailed uh, regional scale and geological map, map, uh, model. Uh, you can see the extract then on, on the right side bottom for the specific poker area. It's not detailed enough. So we are now going to refine this model with the new data. So basically the LiDAR data and the underground LiDAR data and the 3D uh, electromagnetic data that we get from Radai on the next slide. You can see the different steps that are now required. So we are also taking account uh, detailed profiles that are available. Uh, we are creating also the existing mines in, in 3D. And you can see on, on the right bottom, this is already the point clouds from, from the old mines that has, have been mapped in the underground. This will be integrated into the 3D geological model. And what we want to come up at the end on the next slide is then um, mineral prospectivity mapping uh, model in, in 3D. So you can see two examples here from, from models in the Erzgebirge that we have done in the past, whereas the, the right picture is something of tin scans, which have been mapped in 2.5Ds. And then the left bottom is, is something in 3D. So it will show um, interpretation where we can find tin deposits of a specific time in, into depth in, in the underground. And this is based on surface data being integrated uh, with the drone data and also the, the near fields data. So with this, I can hand over to, to Carmen and you can continue with the other sides. Okay, thank you, Andres. So I'll continue with next uh, trail. This is Panagyrish to Bulgaria. Um, the target of, for exploration are porphyry copper and uh, epithermal deposits in the area. Um, and uh, based on uh, infrared and multispectral drone supported survey and satellite survey, together with the field data, we will create uh, GIS based maps uh, for alteration assemblages and also will try to do mineral prediction for most protective areas for drilling and targeting for exploration. Um, so Pan Panagyurishte is part uh, of the Srednogorje zone, which is located in the most uh, western part of the global Tetio region copper belt that continues from uh, Europe through Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, and Malaysia. Uh, target for explorations are two porphyry systems, like Uvrak and Sarasen, in the center part of the area, and uh, three epithermal gold systems, Oshitsa, Ratka to the north, and Krasen 
So they are located around granitic intrusion in volcanic uh, sequences of andesitic rocks that have been deposited between 19 and 86 million years ago. Uh, maybe you know that most exploration companies restrict the remote sensing, but uh, this increased the expensive data for geophysical survey, geochemistry, etc. Uh, that's why uh, we'll combine several type of data, Earth observation data from satellites, uh, drone supported mapping in 3D. Here we have example for thermal infrared and also when and if necessary in this part we will test LiDAR uh, system uh, how it works where we have grass cover and it's a tree cover. Here is the team from Sofia University that during the field trip collect field samples and data at black work and grass and deposits also we done uh, months ago uh, some uh, stream sediments uh, sampling and panning and we found visible gold around the river around this uh, deposit of grass and uh, in addition we will we'll use portable higgs rf uh, um, short wave infrared mapping, XRD and Raman uh, mapping of minerals during the field trail, trails next year. Also we've done uh, 3D modeling by means of flip rock that will uh, be processed uh, with the Vangeo predicting software and uh, we'll try to do some prognosis for uh, mineralization in the lateral and ver vertical extents. Also, we have remote sensing uh, data. Uh, here is example of old Aster image uh, uh, with the places of the operating mines that now close it, most of them, and uh, will uh, improve exploration targeting and decision making at the end of the day, and uh, we'll try to estimate the mineral potential of the area with preparation of 3D maps and uh, um, outlining the areas for targeting and drilling. So, next field trial is in Russia, Pwani, Romania. Uh, it's, uh, the target is exploration for copper ore and uh, low-grade copper as it is in porphyry system 0.1 copper. Uh, great. Uh, and so the aim is to get mineralogical uh, knowledge and also environmental impact assessment around the uh, open pit mine. Uh, so here is the picture of the mine and the bottom of the mine. And uh, this is in, also in volcanic sequences, similar like in Bulgaria, Andesitic and uh, uh, posted in sedimentary environment. During the field trials, uh, blasting uh, and environmental impact assessment has been done about, for, about the blasting, also uh, sampling of the open pit mine and analysis of the sample and also uh, positioning of the boreholes and uh, analysis of gas, uh, gases. Also uh, very important for the open pit mines is slope stability uh, and uh, the modeling has been done uh, uh, by our colleague Doro uh, for the slope stability of the mine and it's important for the safety of the mine and uh, further exploration. Detecting acid mine drainage is another task that uh, uh, will be developed. Here you see example of well established indices and machine learning approach uh, that will be used uh, for analysis of this data uh, in the future. Uh, so, the expected outcomes uh, for this field trail, trail are to reduce blasting, to determine volumes of withdrawn rock, and to manage environmental risk assessment in addition to prediction of landslides of the benches of the mine. Next field trial is uh, Pehasalmi Mine, Finland, which is one of the deepest mines in Europe. It's copper zinc mine sulfide. And uh, the aim of the field trail is to uh, increase the safety, fee, safety and uh, for mine reuse uh, based on global navigation system, precise system for location uh, in the mine. 
the mind uh, is located uh, in the um, Pihavari area, uh, in town of Pihavari, Finland, and has uh, around uh, 1,400 meter depth uh, shaft, which contains an uh, uh, lead sink and copper. But now it's in process of uh, closing. Uh, the underground uh, the mine has two areas: uh, open pit mine and under uh, and uh, underground parts, uh, together with the tailings. And uh, during the field trails, uh, will be used uh, and has been done at the moment by radar drawn by the multispectral measurements. Here you can see, and uh, here um, see the visualization, uh, visualization of these uh, measurements and part of the monitoring of, uh, of, um, of the tailings around the mine and the uh, piles or piles and waste piles around the mine. Uh, also, this has been uh, in addition to this uh, VTT. Um, has done drone hyperspectral measurements and uh, also installed corner reflectors, reflectors that you could see here uh, for uh, referencing as reference point for ground deformation me measurements uh, by means of Sentinel-1. Uh, we could see a uh, key example of the monitoring of mining uh, process and ecological condition of the mine that is important task and also automatic calculation um, of temperature indicators of the waste dumps on the surface in the mine in addition to sizing uh, of stockpiles and active areas of the operation uh, with the red uh, color uh, the areas uh, that have been amended uh, in the high level as compared to the other light green areas. Uh, here also will be measured the soil moisture by the time series uh, of Landsat. Here you could see this example, how it goes during the time frame. And also vegetation condition monitoring, uh, which uh, also has been traced during the different uh, time and different months. The, except, uh, the expected outcomes uh, to establish and uh, test uh, mine in mine geolocation system uh, that will help to develop the radius of safety. Also, uh, will help to monitor an authorized accidental movement movement of individual, individuals and uh, machines in the mine and also environmental monitoring and controlling which uh, will be um, improved remarkably by uh, all these uh, tools that we use uh, during the field trails and golden night platform and here is uh, the plan and uh, the area that will be um, positioned and used by, for in mine geolocation system and the next field trail is in Kosovo. It's post closure trail. Here you could see uh, the seven tailings uh, of the lead sink mine that will be studied. And there the aim is to monitor the stability of the tailings and uh, acid mine drainage to evaluate and uh, also to try to evaluate, uh, evaluate the secondary extraction potential, potential of the tailings because they it contains some, um, uh, in addition to lead and zinc, they contain some um, uh, gallium, germanium, indium, taurium, and selenium, which uh, are important uh, for future commodity uh, development and potential, uh, not only in Europe, but uh, in uh, many applications. Uh, another thing that will focus in Trepcha Kosovo is telling stability, which is uh, important uh, for the pollution and erosion, uh, analyzing uh, the land cracks and uh, hazard of seismic, seismic events. 
in addition to investigation of environmental impact uh, with uh, analysis for water quality, dust control, air quality, health impact of the people, and so on. Uh, here you could see the technique of acid main drainage in two areas, uh, Clement and Artana 1, two tailings in uh, this preliminary study in Kosovo. And also during the field trials, uh, will be provided surface sampling, drilling, uh, water sampling, uh, and analysis of acid mine drainage in the area. Uh, well, we have a uh, couple of minutes more, and what I would like to add is that the use cases for development of multi-source earth observation data platform that we're developing during the project aims to improve the complete life cycle of mining operation. This will include from greenfield exploration and, uh, and brownfields in Bulgaria and uh, Germany to feasibility study, mine development, closure and post-closure environmental footprints. I would like to focus your attention on this diagram, uh, which uh, shows uh, briefly the expenditure and development of uh, exploration and mining projects. As you could see, uh, the expenses increase as the project develops, and uh, in the early stages of exploration uh, in brownfield. Uh, and Greenfield, there is a high risk, and with the, all these tools that will develop during the field trails and with the Golden Eye platform, uh, we could reduce these expenses for the mining co companies in the way that uh, uh, we reduce the time for area selection by means by using drone satellites for quick uh, targeting and decision making. And these are two important key notes for decision in mineral exploration. One is when you decide, are you going to proceed with uh, pre feasibility, feasibility study, and to start uh, operation for all reserves calculation? And this is critical if you select a suitable target, are you going to um, develop these targets? And another critical thing is after the feasibility study, um, are you going to decide to develop a mine? Because if you decide this, you need a huge investment. Uh, depending on the size of mine, this is about 100 to 300 millions uh, as common practice. On the other hand, there is a huge risk on all these mining activities starting for the prospecting, exploration, mine development, uh, and closure and post-closure. That include also environmental impact assessment. And uh, all these uh, things uh, need to be uh, monitored. And there is interest from the mining companies. Um, and also, this will be a pilot project that uh, aims to improve mineral deposits inspiration in different, for different cases. We have examples for copper, gold, tin, lithium, etc. different commodities. Some of these elements like lithium uh, are critical metals uh, uh, that uh, need uh, special attention. In addition to gallium, germanium, indium that could be extracted from some of the mining sites. And also, uh, important uh, thing is that I said quick targeting and decision making. For example, if we need, uh, if we have an area that is uh, five or hundred square kilometers, we need to decide quickly in the mining company where to focus their exploration. So in this case, using the remote sensing, uh, based on satellites and drones, we could uh, target quickly for within a month. For example, two months, uh, where is the most uh, promising area? This could save uh, 
let's say five, 10 million uh, uh, amount of money budget for exploration and to reduce this budget uh, to 10% of this. If we uh, uh, reduce the time for exploration for mapping, for example, to map this area you need five years and about uh, 20 people uh, geologists and uh, with additional equipment and uh, techniques to do this. Uh, when, if you select uh, about uh, five, ten square kilometers from the huge area, you could uh, save this money and focus on, uh, uh, on quick targeting. Another important thing for the whole platform the project and the field trails is to attract investors in new space economy that uh, is developing and uh, will attract mining companies to invest in this uh, remote sensing uh, study and uh, products that we're trying to develop. And uh, this, at the end of the day, will improve profitability in the mining operations, which is important for the mining companies and for the economy. So that's all from my side. Thanks to your attention. Thanks to the contributors uh, that are listed here, all the participants in the project. Thank you. Thank you, Commandant Andreas. And we are back on time now, so the schedule is holding. There would be even time for some questions, but I don't see any in the chat. Please use the chat for the questions. Okay. It would be time to start the networking session, but for some reason I don't see Seva here. No worries. Um, I will be taking over for this one. Okay. Be good. Okay. Yeah, we had a last minute change uh, on our side. Okay. And um, so here, welcome everybody again. So uh, to this networking session and um, well, I promised uh, at the previous uh, uh, part of the, of the presentation session that we would like to start with showing the live demonstration of uh, the GUI product of uh, the platform that we developed uh, to uh, visualize some of the things that have been done on the project and also to uh, encourage the discussion among the participants. So in order to do this, I will uh, share my screen now. Hope it all works as intended. Right, so I'm going to move things. If, if you have questions, uh, please uh, type them in uh, the, uh, the, in the, in the, in the question form uh, of the WebEx. And uh, Marco, could you please relay the question to me? Because when I'm presenting, I'm not seeing uh, these questions. Um, Certainly. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, let's go to the... Um, demonstration of the GUI developed. So after the login, so currently the platform is operational. It's, uh, it has a limited number of users, but it is deployed um, in the Amazon cloud. So the GUI is uh, accessible and the AI assistant is working and the data from the project sites uh, is available and streaming into the platform. So uh, the main components of uh, the GUI are consisting with the uh, interface to the artificial intelligence assistant, which uh, is serving uh, the user, the operator, and uh, presents uh, various results that have been achieved by the analytical part in the backend. There are tools, toolbox, which is used to uh, perform some basic tasks, uh, such as uh, measurements, defining the areas of interest, polygons, deleting them, uh, zooming in, uh, skipping to locations, etc. And there is also the navigation panel, which allows to switch uh, between uh, different modes, as well as to activate uh, the, uh, the spanning and positioning. And at the bottom of the screen, you see the informational panel about the current zoom factor, the geographic position of the cursor or the hand, and uh, the current scale of the map. On in the bottom, there is attribution 
part which dynamically changes when the different imagery and the different data is served to the user. So uh, you can actually talk to the AI, for example, let's be nice and uh, greet the AI and uh, it would reply. The AI is made uh, in a way that um, uh, you could always ask him for help and uh, the interaction with the platform is very simple. So uh, you can, for example, ask him to show me, uh, well, London, right? Uh, the interface is uh, to the AI is actually following the uh, human language interface. So uh, it understands the basic commands. So it's, but we expect you to follow the certain pattern. The first should be the verb. Then, uh, well, you could optionally use like uh, adjectives like me. Uh, then uh, the area of interest should always be capitalized uh, to help AI to understand that this is not just some, you know, uh, normal word, but this is actually the geographic area. So uh, you can ask, uh, let's actually visualize some of the results of the GoldenEye project. So show me all uh, results um, and I, you could specify uh, what do you want to show mines, uh, you know, uh, um, time series, uh, fields, whatever you're looking for. But in this case, I would like uh, our AI to show me everything. And uh, I will uh, start with uh, Bulgaria, Bulgaria case. And I will re limit the range um, of the findings uh, that I will uh, be, would like to see to 100 kilometers. By default, the range is 500 kilometers and because we have several sites uh, co-located um, uh, in uh, close vicinity, then we will uh, see too many results at once. Uh, okay, demo effects, no documents. Okay, let's increase to 150 because we are measuring uh, from the center of uh, the uh, region. So let's actually increase it a little bit more to 200. I hope we're not catching uh, Romania in this. Okay, now we're getting it. So uh, we are calculating the uh, availability of products from the geographical center of the region that was specified. So that's why uh, when I specified Bulgaria and gave the range, which is too, too small, then the centers simply didn't fell in. So um, into the search criteria. We can start with uh, uh, looking at uh, the Sentinel-2 uh, imagery, which was acquired. So you could get information about the metadata, which products were used to, to calculate and generate this imagery, and which project uh, and which uh, region of interest is used. So if you click uh, the product uh, in the selection window, it immediately becomes selected and added to the layers. Uh, what you can do here, we can uh, use different um, underlay or base layers to visualize uh, the, the map. So, for example, I'm switching from the satellite imagery to the map. And here uh, we can also switch to the 3D mode. So enable the 3D mode and uh, I will also enable the camera motion. So I will kind of like reposition it and get closer. So things like mountains and um, other interesting uh, things will be displayed for us. Uh, we can zoom in and see um, the uh, 3D objects uh, clearly visible. Uh, we have also prepared the polarimetric SAR visualization of this area. So here they slightly overlap. And I would like to show you how to be able to use these. So let's move in and let's select the mountains uh, area where we could actually see some, some geometry on the surface. And uh, let's say that I would like to see um, and, and zoom in uh, to the data. Uh, with uh, uh, the special tool that we developed, uh, it allows us to see several um, layers at the same time. So, for example, we will start uh, with uh, the polarimetric SAR visualization. And let's say that I'm interested, what are these yellow spots here represent uh, to us? So, I will uh, select uh, this. Uh, this is the top layer. Then I would like to see uh, the street map 
And I would also like to see the satellite view from the base level uh, underneath it. And I will increase the range of the visibility. And here is my tool, which allows me to drill through various results and see what is uh, displayed here. So, for example, it's clearly becoming visible that the yellow area depicted in the polarimetric SAR image is actually a, 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 a small village called Rosino in, in Bulgaria. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you could select uh, dynamically. Uh, Carmen, could you guide me to the area which is more interesting? Yeah, could you could you move uh, to the south a little bit? Yes. Okay, just uh, start or sell. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, let's see here. What is it? Yeah, so this is uh, some some uh, what what we can see based on the generic interpre interpretation of polarimetric SAR imagery. The colors have the following meaning. Um, the green in this visualization scheme means that the area with low coherence and average uh, strong uh, return of the uh, radar signal, which uh, typically indicates a lot of change. And this is uh, this is what's given to us by a vegetated area. And if we look yes. at it, it's mountainous regions with a lot of vegetation. If we could go to the south, it's south of Panagiris, there is star cells to the north. Just okay. move to the south, yeah. More, more to the south, okay. More to the south, yeah, please. So we have some blue areas, for example, which are uh, lakes. So this is, they typically come as blue or black, depending on uh, the uh, uh, on the state of uh, the uh, of the um, of the waterbed uh, uh, of the lake. So if it's windy or not, uh, the 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 SAR signal could be giving us different areas. So do we see anything interesting coming? No, uh, no, no, more, more? To, the, to the east. And uh, let me see, it's it's turned, it's oriented to the north the image. Right now, yes, it's yes, oriented to yes, the north. Yes, it's okay. A little bit more to the south. Just south, this is uh, Sidinenia. And now we are somewhere here. Yeah, it's a lot, it's uh, okay to the um, east. East. Okay, yeah, so now we have already Plovdiv, so large now, city. Now we're in Plovdiv, so then to the west, we have to move west of Plovdiv. Yes. West of Plovdiv, and maybe here, this is Panagyurishta to the... A little bit, little bit to the north. North, so this is the Panagyurishta area. Yes, where is Panagyurishta? It's a lap, it's a... No, it's... Uh, maybe this is Panagyurishta to the north. To the north, oh. uh, Jalak Tsarimir. No, to the to the uh, west a little bit. To the west. To the west. Uh, okay. oh, sorry. This is east for me. West, yeah. West. A little bit more. This should be here. The yellow spot Panagiris. Yeah. No, it's Sidinania. This oh. to the south. <laughs> okay, let's no, uh, zoom out. Uh, yes, let's zoom out because it's too. too mm. And I will uh, switch quickly the uh, visualization layer. So yeah. I will show you how to. I quickly, think this is Panagiris here. Uh, yeah. can, how to quickly get Let things. Me see I will. What, what we're looking here. Yeah. yeah. So this is the map. Panagiris is to the here. To the yeah, here is Panagiris. This is to Panagiris. the north, 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 north. Here. No, now to the east, to the, no, 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 not so much. Here, if you see, okay, stop here and move to the, no, no, no. A little bit to the north, a little bit, more, 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 more. And go to the west. Now to the west. Oh, yeah, I see, it. yeah, I see it. Yeah, see, it. okay. So this is, so the, this is the area here, it's important to see the faults uh, by these uh, INSAR images. Yeah, so yes. we have this. Yeah, okay. okay. So let's enable our layers. Now, if we have here this area, right? Yes. Yes, I see. Yeah, this area is important. You could see the changes of the colors, so with bright colors. Mm -hmm. And this is so called um, cross and fault. It's huge fault zone this, this, in this area. Right. Okay. This one. You could enlarge it a little bit. Yes. Yeah, we could also amplify the uh, this, the terrain a little bit. 
Yes. To emphasize the mountains, because uh, this area yes. is not very mountainous, exactly. but to help us with visualization and actually to visually detect, because with the 2D yeah. uh, screen, uh, we don't see the 3D uh, objects, but yeah, now exactly. it's, it's much easier to uh, understand what's happening. So we can this see is yeah, this the green color of the mountains. Here you have a river, river. and a fault. Yes. And could you could you enlarge this part a little bit to the south when you have a uh, yellow? This is uh, Popinzi should be Popinzi. I think the uh, Anagorista uh, Bata. Yes, a little bit to the to the east, a little bit to east, move. East, east. Okay. A little bit more. Okay, here in this area. Huh? This this what is this here? The yellow spot and green one. Yeah, so okay. this is interesting because uh, we he see here a lot of uh, different colors uh, in yes. the uh, radar uh, visualization. Of course, this uh, this visualization is very coarse, so we have about twenty meters per pixel. And you could already see uh, uh, very interesting colors uh, where the sands uh, are mm -hmm. uh, visible. Uh, well, of course, cities are always yellow, but uh, this blue, uh, pink, uh, red colors are uh, interesting because they yes. indicate the different content of moisture in the ground. So, for example, where you see blue, that is typically indicating the areas where the uh, strong cross polarization is happening of the reflected signal. And that could be happening because of moist uh, soil or because of specific properties of uh, the soils or, or, or rocks in, in which are exposed uh, to, uh, to the radar. I wish to add in geological point of view, all these uh, dark uh, blue areas, they mark regional faults you could see here in this part and in mm -hmm. this part. Okay, very interesting. And now, uh, the last but not least, we can show you uh, the uh, the clusters which were detected by uh, AI uh, based on the similar data which we used by, for the uh, polarimetric SAR. And we can enable these clusters, uh, uh, which could be further studied uh, at the same time uh, and showing us uh, which predictions AI made um, based on uh, the different reflections and the different uh, backscattering of the radio. Uh, signals of the SAR. So it's based on the same data set that was presented in this Pulsar, but uh, we could analyze it on the sequential, a sequential time series, basically how the data is changing based on seasons and or between acquisitions uh, for the change detection, as well as uh, we could also use this polarimetric uh, changes. So this is where things like uh, vegetation, uh, urban areas, uh, different types of rocks are uh, becoming detected uh, easily and they are being mapped um, and uh, visualized uh, for analysis on this map. So if uh, higher resolution data is used, like with commercial data, uh, these uh, visualizations are becoming much more, uh, much more uh, valuable. So the GUI allows us to show up to 32 layers of visualization simultaneously. So you could uh, drill and analyze uh, and uh, perform uh, different uh, visual inspections, um, uh, comparing different data which have been displayed with AI uh, here uh, on the fly. You could move the layers, rearrange. So if I want to move, for example, my uh, Sentinel-2 image to the top, so, and I will just drop it up. Sorry, let me be careful when I share my screen. Um, I will drop it around this way. Yeah, so the, oh, okay, I moved the wrong one. When I share my screen, I'm kind of losing the precision. Okay, now it does what I want. So I moved the Sentinel image to the top of the stack and uh, my polarization is below it and the clusters are below that. So I can select a different set. So let's just say I would like to have this cluster in the middle and um, right, I will add it to uh, the lens. 
And you see this blue blue cluster starts appearing at the outer rim of my yeah. of mm -hmm. my lens. So if I see something interesting, I'm coming here and I'm analyzing what it is. So uh, agriculture is very interesting, uh, visible in a in a good way because it gives us moist areas with uh, which are uh, having. Uh, so in this case, it's it's aligned with, uh, with with irrigated area, I think, or with a particular type of vegetation. So this is interesting to monitor. Uh, in uh, the uh, in, in this view, so seeing the ability to see uh, multiple bands and uh, visualized bands at the same time is very powerful, because it allows the human eye to see the invisible and allows the human brain to understand uh, something that was not understandable easily before we we uh, had this visualization. And last but not least, we can also, I think, uh, even add the drone data, which was acquired from. It's it's going to be added to the top. I think this is a drone uh, auto mosaic that was uh, provided by you, uh, yeah. Professor Kamen. Um, so it's a large file, so it will take a little uh, for it to to load. And once it's the loading is finished, uh, we will uh, zoom to it. I hope we didn't exceed the number of layers. Yeah, here it is. Yes. So you so have it on top. Would you could you analyze the eastern part of this this uh, hill? The eastern yeah. part here. Uh, this oh, western, yeah, yeah, this one. This one Around yeah. so this this is uh, old volcano. You could see the ring structures. No, oh. to the just. Okay, to the let, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at trying to see the rings. Yeah. So here they okay. This is volcano, right? So and it's a popular. And, and this another volcano. I, I'm interested in the uh, another one. This one. This one, yeah, this one, yeah, this one on okay. the top from the top, yeah. Yes. And uh, could we analyze all this? Uh, blue yeah. Let, let me areas? bring let me bring uh, the um, the polarimetric SAR image yes, to the yes, top. Yes. Yes. Uh, so that's I will disable important. the clusters for now, so that they don't interfere with my view. I will bring uh, the Sentinel One pulsar to uh, actually I will bring it as a second mm -hmm. and I will uh, make oh, it uh, one, yeah. and I will make it um, I will add it to my lens so okay. here are uh, the uh, yes we are interested exactly in this area that you are now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a to very bright area yeah. so a lot of different colors is especially mm -hmm. in this yes. segment uh, so let me move the pulsar to the very top now yeah could you could you focus on the top of the volcano where is that yeah so this is the top of the volcano ah yes you could uh, see we, here the green we see areas. Uh, we see yellow areas which are clearly uh crop outcrops of rock so the yes. yellow areas are solid and with the white areas are uh, being extremely solid uh areas typically we see them in the urban areas you see yes. this white uh, circle so let me disable the lens yeah, no. our circle is uh, the the uh, the province village probably. Let's this uh, one. let's enable the lens again, yeah. and in this case, this I will what is uh, it. modify the selection. So I will uh, yeah make it like this. So it's I don't see the village here. This is an interesting area. It's not a village. We'll this is not a village. Here. This is just a, a ring structure which is uh, well it should be forest but nevertheless the rocks are uh going not through, cropping yeah not cropping through and we see that with the strong reflected signal probably yeah. this area even acts as a corner reflector so could you could you later enlarge this piece and send it to me to analyze because we are we're preparing now analysis of this data maybe this is the top of this uh, volcano Yes, it, it looks like it. Yeah. It looks like, yeah, this is. You can have this analysis done yourself now because the GUI is available and uh, you could uh, actively explore all the data okay. sets and you could give us more of the data sets, of course. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, which uh, could be uh, visualized uh, better. So I'm, I'm going to add uh, the, uh, the ortho mosaic image to this so that you could see so that this is uh, this is yes. this is the area that's giving you a, a very mm -hmm. high signal. So it's barren. So it's not forestry forested as uh, as shown here. I don't know why, 
Is it because uh, you were acquiring the drawing imagery in the different seasons than the satellite um, baseline? Yeah, maybe. And that was giving us a very strong uh, reflection yeah. reflections for the radar. So the yellow areas are rocks. Uh, the red yellow areas are interesting uh, too because this is some could be some strange uh, geological formation or shape. Yes, this uh, this uh, doubt crop of secondary quartzites in the area. There's uh, a lot of quartz area, silicified area. Yeah, very interesting. And as you see, the maps are showing us nothing, and uh, the geo yeah. uh, the topological map also doesn't give us a lot of details because mm -hmm. it's incorrect. You see the second concentric circle shows us the topological uh, map and it is not what we see here. We see a deep here. Yeah. And uh, here it shows that there's no deep. This is just uh, literally a smooth slope of the volcano. Yes, we, we took samples just in this area. So it's interesting to, <laughs> to check them. And to... Yeah, we are waiting to receive the um, the, the EM scans of this area, the LIDAR scans of this area, yeah. and uh, perhaps uh, some more in-situ measurements. And uh, we will, I think, uh, if necessary, we can already uh, add this area to more detailed uh, image acquisition, so we could order uh, Terrasar uh, yeah. in multiple polarizations, so, so that we could get a high-resolution uh, view of this area during the field trials when they begin next yes, year. Yes, it will be very good. Yeah. So any more questions from the audience and uh, people uh, who have been uh, monitoring this? Uh, uh, may I have a question? Yes, of course. Uh, so if we uh, select and know that, uh, for example, the, the yellow color, uh, some altered rocks, can we train the image to, if they are tested, verified in this area, that these andesitic rocks with quartz, to map them like this? Yes, of course. So the clusters that we have here could be uh, adjusted. Uh, the parameterization of the AI algorithm could be uh, tuned so that it would find these, uh, these features that you are looking for. Okay. So then they will be automatically mapped and you just select the desired cluster like here, I'm, I'm doing here. So I will bring this to the top. Yes, we'll do it, we'll test it, it will be very useful. And you will have a map of, uh, of uh, yeah, the area that looks for specific that's... parameters. And then we could use it even more because uh, right now uh, this analysis was only performed based on Sentinel-1 data, but because yes. we are adding Astir, and uh, we are expecting to acquire Worldview 3 imagery with uh, multiple near infrared bands. So these uh, predictions could be refined in terms of uh, uh, in terms of different data sets, right? Yeah. As well as high resolution. So by combining yeah. SAR uh, electromagnetic and near infrared and uh, shortwave infrared uh, images in multiple resolutions in different spectras required in different time, we could feed this to AI and apparently find new findings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Very yeah, so good. another interesting site, so I will quickly reset this and uh, I will show you this, uh, show me, uh, show. Because uh, this open pit site uh, is yeah. uh, is uh, very uh, well impressive. <laughs> so here we are, and mm -hmm. I will enable three D view. I will switch the amplifier a little bit, and uh, we will rotate. So here you can see the open pit in details. Yeah, this source point. Yes, yes, this is Rosha Poeni, and this part is uh, the Ortho uh, image uh, from the drones. Yeah. And this one is the base layer, which was acquired uh, several yeah. years ago by, uh, I'm checking, uh, we are getting it from uh, Digital Globe, so I think it's uh, one of their satellites. And if we zoom in to uh, the higher level, we could yeah. see individual mm -hmm. trucks here uh, in this yeah. imagery. Mm -hmm. And at certain magnification layers, we don't. We even see uh, stones, uh, which are visible. Yes, you, you see also the fault here, which is 
Oh, super. Yeah, very, very good details. Yeah, so we just have to wait a little for the system yeah. to uh, extract this layer and uh, present it to us. So, yeah, all this becomes possible because analysis of the imagery uh, in, uh, in, uh, in um, highest details from various data sources becomes easy with GoldenEye platform, which uh, is typically not uh, the case. So uh, you need very specialized platforms. So just to compare, to do the same thing in ArcGIS, it will be a lot of effort. And to yeah. do the same things in uh, uh, QGIS or, uh, or ESA snap is impossible. So if you would like to visualize polarimetric SAR data together with drone imagery, together with base layer, together with uh, clusters, uh, you can forget about it. And if you want to visualize the time series, which we are going, doing, uh, going to show you here. So there are three sites, for example, where we were measuring the moisture indexes. Um, mm -hmm. And so we could focus on this one because we have the uh, optical side uh, so and we can visualize the time series for the Orvi index. So uh, we see different dates where we were calculating uh, the Orvi. Orvi is a radar vegetation index, which also is a good representation of the moisture for the area. So this parameter is calculated as an integral value for the entire area or represented as area of interest with this yellow. And if I click on any of the buttons, it would show me the, the raster image for this particular uh, uh, index. There is one question in the chat. Yes. Can you show the Sentinel-2 clusters from Bulgaria? Thank you. It's from Francisco. Uh, Sentinel-2 cluster from Bulgaria. Okay, yeah. uh, let me do that, uh, of course. So uh, let's scroll up. Um, uh, Sentinel-2 clusters uh, from Bulgaria. It's this one, right? I think. So I will switch it on. I will add them one by one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is uh, clusterization results based on Sentinel-2 bands, uh, which were uh, performed uh, uh, with uh, the data that I showed you earlier um, in in this uh, in these images. There are some cloud presence, unfortunately, in them, but uh, overall uh, the results are pretty satisfactory already. I am just expecting and uh, waiting to see the results that we will receive with Worldview 3 when we get them. That would be even better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry to say, but I think our time seems to be up. Yes, uh, well, we still have some, maybe a couple more questions, networking. I see we have, uh, I don't know if uh, you, if, if attendees can speak uh, or join, but, but uh, we see somebody from Space Force. I can give them a uh, turn to speak. Uh, they raise their hand and uh, you allow them to. Oh, very turn. good. So then I can, uh, I can give this possibility. Let me know. Of course. So, any anybody present uh, of the attendees wants to network, please raise your hand, and we can bring you to the panel so that you can speak. Everybody's too shy. <laughs> yeah, this is the disadvantage of the virtual meetings that we could not uh, easily interact with the with the audience. Otherwise, we would just. Uh, I enjoyed in the past uh, the few weeks um, breakout ev events uh, where the networking session was naturally achieved by the end of the presentations and then people were going for coffee and discussing interesting topics. Well, now you want me to unmute them all. So basically this way everybody can talk together. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, if there are no no other no say. other things uh, it's difficult also to present and not to see people's faces that's, that's another true. disadvantage 
but I really hope that in the next uh, version of this workshop, uh, we will have uh, more um, lively interaction with the audience uh, in person. It's always easier. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to thank you at the end of this uh, to all the presenters and organizers of this uh, side event um, for preparing and for arranging this session uh, from myself and from my company. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you also from my Thanks side. Well. It was a pleasure to follow the presentations. They were excellent. And um, I hope everybody has enjoyed the conference and have a nice weekend all. And if you have any questions or you wish to contact us, it takes place via all the attendees and also via me. So feel free to contact if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye until you, we meet again. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you all.